Epic Hits and Epidemiology, I prepare a, a talk every year, and I give it at all the health departments. So uh, you're at the tail end of it. I gave this last April, so I'm getting pretty good at it by now. So but, uh, please in, jump in at any time you'd like to. Um, my background is laboratory. Um, I got a degree from ECU in 1982, uh, master's degree in public health from UNC Chapel Hill in 2000. Um, I was the microbiology supervisor at Craven Regional Medical Center in Newburn for 23 years, and then um, somebody started mailing anthrax letters, and I had a, suddenly had a brand new career with that um, anthrax letters. I promise I did not mail those letters, <laughs> but um, I did have a new career, and it's a fantastic career, but for the last 15 years, I've been the public health epidemiologist at Biden Medical Center. It's a fantastic job. So this is the um, state map where the public health epidemiologists are located. And uh, we're in large hospitals. In 2001, when we had the anthrax letters, the um, state health department wanted to get more information from hospitals. And that time, HIPAA had just come out. You know, HIPAA was brand new in 2001. And hospitals were very wary of saying anything. Even the public health, they were very quiet about that. So um, the concept with North Carolina State Health Department was, let's give the large hospitals a grant and let them hire an epidemiologist to look through the hospital records and let those hospital records contribute to the community as far as what's going on in the community and how they can best prepare by looking at the sickest of the sick in the hospital and then knowing what was going on in the community. And it's a fantastic thing to have public health epidemiologists in the hospital because that's where all your sick people come in. And if you're looking for sick people, a hospital is the place to be. So the objectives today are short and sweet. Um, support the team. Um, learn something and have some fun talking about laboratory testing and outbreaks. Okay, my hospital I'm known as the flu guy, so I've got to talk about influenza. We're right in the middle of the flu season. And this is the CDC chart as far as the state map. And this chart is easy to read that um, red is bad and green is good. So we, I looked at this chart this morning. There is no green on this chart whatsoever. So uh, we're right, the whole country is really in the middle of our flu outbreak right now. But the yellows are uh, kind of intermediate, the orange is a step up, and then the red is a uh, high level. So as the flu guy, I collect all the uh, influ positive influenza testing from the hospital. I like doing this because the lab testing is like a week ahead of the um, state, state health report and the CDC's report, so I get a little bit of advance notice, and you'll see that the last two weeks, these are weekly numbers, so the last two columns, these columns here um, are pretty much plateaued. It didn't change. It might have dropped a little bit last week. I was looking at the last two days, though. So I've gotten some astronomical numbers the last two days for flu. Um, early on, we had a lot of influenza B. Um, now I'm getting more influenza A. Um, and um, the influenza A that I'm getting is H1N1. I hadn't had, I've had one case of H3N2, but 99% of it's been H1N1. So these are what the non-vitant hospitals have been reporting as far as positive flu test. Here's the state report. The state report comes out every Thursday. And what we're looking at for this current year is that red line. Um, this peak behind it is the flu season from two years ago. That was the worst flu season I'd ever seen. It was terrible. When I went to the emergency department waiting room, it was elbow to elbow. All our waiting room seats were full. So that was a very bad flu season right there. Um, this is last year. Um, that flu season was long, but it was a moderate flu season. It was kind of a very typical flu season, but it was it did last into, we had positive tests going into June. You know, We used to ask, well, is it possible to get flu in the summertime? Yes, it's possible to get flu in the summertime. So the epidemiologist toolbox, we have three things, um, person, place and time. Um, last year, um, I don't know if I came here last year, but last year um, I usually like to use movie themes and nobody does place like um, Forrest Gump and I really want to concentrate this year on that thing of place. That The toolbox is person, place, and time, so everything today I'm going to talk about has some sort of association with place. Um, so what is it about place? Um, North Carolinians are Linians are said to have a strong sense of place. Um, the first question when you meet a North Carolinian, they will ask you is, uh, where are you from? And I think we ask that. You know, it's, 
I'm a lazy person. I, yeah, I want to ease conversation. It kind of draws you into the conversation, but you can make some conclusions by where people are from and have a good conversation. So I think that's why North Carolina, they're, they're talking to people and they just want to have a good conversation with you right from the very get-go, right from that initial uh, first impression. So we're talking about place today. So um, something that's re very unique has happened with place this year, in the last month, that um, the Wuhan China no novel coronavirus. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I do have a few slides that I've got a big talk at the hospital tomorrow, so I'm kind of using y'all as the guinea pigs for my hospital talk tomorrow. But um, this was a beautiful article from the New York Times uh, Saturday of this week, and they were the first ones to put all this together. They've got like six things that we need to know. But one, I like, I love this chart here. They were talking about, um, they, they combined two things that we need to know. Um, How is it spreading person to person? Right now they're saying it's the R0 value or the RO value or the reproductive value. And they're saying typically early on when they were looking at this, that one infection, one person with coronavirus was leading on to two other people. So that's an R value of two, meaning that it's doubling with each person that it doubles. Um, so on the bottom, they've got kind of the common cold, um, chicken pox. Um, chicken pox would be about eight people would be infected with one case of chicken pox. Here's the common cold here. So they're pretty much saying for this new coronavirus is a two. So they've got it on the chart right there about a two. And then they're looking at severity. How bad is this germ? How bad is this disease? Um, they looked at the first 40 cases. They looked at the first 100 cases. So this is really preliminary data. So they don't have many cases here, but they're kind of thinking that the um, case fatality rate, as far as people who are officially diagnosed with uh, coronavirus and then the number dies, that number that dies out of that group is the case fatality rate. They're thinking that that is about 2%. So that's, um, it's easy that the uh, reproductive value is two, the R value is two, and the case fatality rate right now, with those early cases, we think is two. Uh, that's their early estimates. Um, with some of the coronaviruses we've seen, like I like to talk about the, the MERS virus, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. MERS virus, the host is the camel. And um, the people who are associated with the camel, the first person associated with camel, has a high risk of a severe infection. The further you get away from that camel, the less and less this disease becomes. We've seen like two or three generations passing person to person to person. But you know, is this virus gonna run itself out the further it gets away from its source host? Um, we don't know those answers, but what they've done with this chart is, in this pink box, they think that's kind of weird. We're gonna see um, what the impact is to our community. Right now, we're doing a lot of containment activities. Um, if it gets past the containment activities, we still want to keep those containment activities going because we want to slow this thing down. We don't want everybody to get sick at one time. That really depletes our resources. You know, we've got a limited number of resources. We've got a limited number of beds. So if even we have this strategy with the flu too, we don't want everybody getting sick on the, the same week. That um, It's called a sharp peak. What we want is a very dull peak. Um, we do want to care for all these people. We, want, we need to spread it out over time. So even if we find that the containment efforts aren't really containing it, we still want to do that to slow the virus down. Um, so this chart is really that pink box there is really where we're thinking the coronavirus is going to end up at. So with that being said, <clears throat> hospitals need to start planning. So there are 17 functions that hospitals need to plan for. Um, Surveillance is what I do. I do that every day, looking at the number of flu cases that are in the hospital, uh, looking at the number of common colds, looking at the number of RSV, looking at the number of salmonella, shigella, uh, gonorrhea, salmonella, syphilis, those things like that. Second one is communications. It's going to be very important for us. If we find one in the hospital, it's now state law, I think. When is state law? February 3rd. That if you suspect somebody with coronavirus, you are obligated to call the health department and let them know that uh, it's not just a confirmed case. If you suspect somebody has coronavirus, uh, you're calling, you're letting the health department know. So that's part of that communication. Education is something we do all the time. Um, infection control, I heard three people introduce themselves as infection control nurses, so thank you. Um, visitation, uh, hospital visitation, 
we have, in my hospital, we call it phase one with, with the baby virus, RSV. It's a respiratory virus that kids get. Uh, when we see that, uh, we say that kids can't visit kids in children's hospital, and that's phase one for us. Um, phase two is when the flu starts hitting. When we get into that full-blown flu season, we'll say that children under 12 can't visit hospital-wide. So that's phase two for us. Um, if coronavirus gets really bad, uh, we've yet to define what phase three is yet. So that's something our hospital planners are deciding. Um, you know, people carry this virus, and the fewer people we have in the hospital is better as far as limiting spread. So the fewer people, the less spread I'm going to have, that social distancing. Um, so what is that visitation going to look like if we have to go to phase three? And the thought is that, you know, at phase three might be just primary caregivers. That, I, you know, if you're in charge of that person when they go home, if you're the mother, the father, um, that you'll be the visitors, but, uh, you know, there won't be any aunts, uncles, and things like that, that uh, you'll be the primary caregivers for that patient when they go home. Um, facility security, um, it's going to be a tense situation, so we want do want to have that. Um, employee health, uh, human resources, occupational health, we want to make sure we're protecting our employees, that we've got to make sure they stay well and uh, make sure they've got the PPE, the personal protective equipment, and then if they do get exposed, that tracking them and also our employees that are exposed, we have to report to the health department too for that follow-up. Uh, pharmacy, um, pharmacy right now, there's no vaccine. There's no, there's no specific treatment. The treatment is supportive care. The things that we do for pneumonia, the things we do for sepsis, we still are going to do that with coronavirus. But um, as far as the vaccine, they're working on it. Um, we don't have one yet. Um, typically, a vaccine is at least a year to make. Um, I don't. They've never had a coronavirus vaccine, so I think a lot of that is just kind of speculative. Um, and then, as far as treatment, um, Taiwan did say that they cured somebody. They had one case they cured with Tamiflu and some of the HIV drugs. Um, somebody, one of the doctors was pointing out to me that was just one case. So when people overcome coronavirus too. There are some very mild cases of coronavirus. And I say mild cases of coronavirus, but some people are even asymptomatic with coronavirus. So it runs the full spectrum from um, asymptomatic to a severe disease. Information systems, um, we're doing a lot with information systems. We got a new information system in my hospital and it's fabulous. It's a lot to learn. The learning curve is high, um, but <clears throat> it really is helping us now I can hit a button and I'll know everybody who's traveled from China in my hospital that I can get that report anytime I want in real time that if somebody's traveled from China, it, it shows up on my computer. And then also what we've done with information systems, if somebody says they've, they've got pneumonia, they have a fever and they've come from China, um, the registration person, their computer is going to light up and say uh, it's going to be a, a bulletin to them saying they need to uh, escort the patient to an airborne isolation room. So that's just some beautiful work that we hadn't done. So we're learning more and more from the coronavirus that we'll use for other things, but it really is driving a lot of our knowledge that we're going to learn a lot from coronavirus and create a lot of nice programs from it. Triage as far as how people are coming into the hospital, um, how far at the door are we going to meet them, greet them, are we going to sort them in any way, are we going to sort our waiting room between respiratory illness and uh, broken arms, car wrecks. Um, are we going to do that sort of sorting? We've got a huge waiting room. Um, typically, we hadn't done that. We've got enough room in our waiting room that people kind of self-sort themselves. But uh, should it come to that point, do we start dividing that waiting room between respiratory illnesses and non-respiratory illnesses? Surge capacity. Surge capacity is such as my hospital gets so busy and needs their beds there are certain things that we do like elective surgeries. Are we going to continue to do elective surgeries? And this is a big deal for hospitals that if we have to curtail elective surgeries, um, who has the power at the hospital to do that? And that's basically the hospital president at that level that they need to be involved if there were such a thing. So um, surge capacity is really the hospital president. Um, bed capacity, bed control. Um, we've got at least 30 different units, 30 different floors at my hospital. And uh, we've already decided, you know, what areas would get the um, 
the potential corona patients, and they would get the uh, medical ICU. They'd go on that floor, and they'd get the uh, medical ICU step-down unit. Those would be the first units that we'd fill. Um, but when we um, look at our hospital, when we look at the 30 departments at my hospital, this year, um, 25 of them have hosted, housed a flu patient. So flu really ends up all over my hospital as far as, you know, it's in labor and delivery, it's in the cardiac unit, um, it's in the psych unit, it's in, in the um, behavioral health unit, the rehab unit, um, that you usually get at least one patient, and it's very difficult to control that, um, you know, they, they need, when you have a cardiac patient, they need to be in the cardiac area, but uh, if we get into the corona thing as far as sorting these, putting your corona patients at the end of the hallway or putting your corona patients at the beginning of the hallway. Um, staffing, um, you know, we, keeping our nurse ratio right, um, making sure that um, we'd like to have designated nursing staff for the corona patients so the corona nurses don't go back and forth between like the, the NICU nurses and the, uh, the corona nurses, or the corona patients, excuse me. Um, Medical care, there'll be a lot coming out. This is really for the physicians to decide what's best medical care and keep up with that. Um, consumable supplies. My hospital has 45 days of consumable supplies and people keep asking me, well, what does 45 days mean? Um, um, you know, if it's a panic situation, if everybody's looking for masks, am I gonna consume my 45 days in two days? But we, we've looked at that and um, we've got some fantastic people that we've worked, I've worked with for years that have done the uh, supplies. So we've got a great relationship there. Laboratory is, um, there's a lot now with laboratory as far as wanting, needing to confirm the diagnosis as fast as possible, um, tracking things. Um, right now, the only lab testing available for coronavirus is the CDC in the United States. Um, to me, that means probably a three-day turnaround time before I get my results back. Um, at Vita Medical Center, we hadn't sent anything to the CDC yet, but I'm um, the plan is that for um, once CDC gets comfortable with this testing product, that they'll be disseminating that out to the state laboratory. So even with the state laboratory, that's probably a two-day turnaround time for me to get results back. Um, and COOP, COOP stands for uh, continuous operations. There are things that done at my hospital, such as um, car wreck patients, um, labor and delivery, um, heart attacks. Um, we save lives every day at my hospital. And these are what I call the sanctuary services. So we want to make sure that those areas are protected, that we do not put our corona patients in those sanctuary services, like labor and delivery, cardiac, um, the trauma unit, uh, or will not get uh, coronavirus patients placed in those beds. Okay, I always use a lot of jokes. I can't, I can't help it. I'm a, <laughs> got a lot of humor, but. This was in this week's weekend's newspaper. Um, uh, they're talking about Poxitani Field. He saw his, his shadow. And he's, he heard about the coronavirus, and he's not coming out again. So please excuse me for the humor, um, but it does keep us awake. You know, I, I've been to public health meetings, and it, they're 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 kind of boring at times. So I want to keep every. It's after lunch too, so I want to keep everybody's attention. Um, so the title of my um, epic, epic Hits in Epidemiology, Part 6, the real title of it is uh, South Park's versus uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. And I showed this to my wife a year ago, and she said, well, Bill, that's okay, but you've got to have some cool-looking graphics to go with it. So I did do that. You know, I added the graphics to, uh, uh, with my wife's suggestion. I think it came out pretty good. Um, but I was with my wife... Uh, Two summers ago, when we were all we we're always looking for something to do while we're on vacation, and we were up in the mountains, the North Carolina mountains, and we were on um, zip lining is new there, and we were wondering, well, what about the zip lining? That, that sounds pretty fun. Should we try that? So you know, we're looking at all the um, tourist information about zip lining places, and uh, when we're looking at for these places, when you're googling it, this comes up: um, over 500 people sick with E. coli outbreak spreads to a Tennessee adventure park, and this is. Uh, we're on the North Carolina side, but on the um, Gatlinburg side of, uh, there's this huge zip line over there um, that, uh, and this is the newspaper article that came out very early on, uh, 500 people sick. So that, that, as an epidemiologist, that caught my attention. It also made me think, I'm not going zip lining this year. So um, this is the South Park thing. Uh, 
Cartman went zipline. You know, Cartman had a bad experience, and he he all he's typically saying, "I, I should have never gone ziplining." But uh, Cartman's problem was um, and he'd had he'd got put up in these trees in the treetops. He's up there for an hour. Cartman had drank too much Mount, diet Mountain Dew that day, and uh, he had a fecal accident up in the the seat. <laughs> so um, you know, with these zip lines, you know, it's hard to think. Well, how do they keep all this equipment clean? You know. I work with infection control nurses, but uh, how do they clean all this stuff? There's so much equipment. How do they keep it all clean? And with the zip line, there's also this bicycle route that uh, people can ride on. So that there's, all this is all through the woods. So people spend a lot of time there. So I actually got the final report from the um, Tennessee State Health Department. <clears throat> and the top line is, um, first line on that, top line is, um, large multi-pathogen outbreak. Yeah, you know, I, I I live outbreaks, and I'd never seen anything listed as a multi-pathogen outbreak. But, uh, you know, I've seen salmonella outbreaks, I've seen uh, cyclospore outbreaks, I've seen shigella outbreaks. I'd never seen anything labeled multi-pathogen outbreak. Um, and then also the uh, report said as many as 2,000 people were sick. Three were hospitalized. So um. With 2,000 people sick and only three going to the hospital, that, that's a very mild illness right there. So um, that's kind of your clue. Some of your clue in them, the um, most common symptoms are nausea and diarrhea. And the median duration is one to two days. When I see mild illness, nausea, vomiting, median duration of two days, um, that really screams norovirus to me as far as um, that scenario. Um, when they... Um, the newspaper and the um, report published these four pathogens here were identified. So norovirus, yes, I agree with norovirus. Um, e. coli, that pathogenic E. coli, that is a very serious disease. And if you were spreading that, if you had 2,000 people sick with this pathogenic E. coli, you'd have a lot more than three deaths from that. Or you'd have a lot more than three hospitalizations from that. The Giardia, um, Giardia is kind of an old school um, disease. I really hadn't seen a Giardia in years, but with um, modern well systems, we pretty much don't have Giardia anymore. Uh, with fresh, clean water, modern wells, and uh, Cyclospora, cryptospor excuse me, Cryptosporidium, that is a very hard laboratory diagnosis to make, and uh, it's made with, um, we've got modern devices now where they can, um, they'll get one stool sample and they can get 30 tests from that one stool sample. So it's amazing laboratory on, um, but this is, and the way that this cryptosporidium came in, it was, yes, that's what they did. They, um, they took their water sample um, and ran this human test on it. The human, pan the stool panel that runs, picks up 30 different agents. They ran this, it, the test is intended for humans. But they used it on their water sample, and their water sample came back with these four pathogens here. The, the laboratory test is not designed for water systems, so that they were kind of breaking the manufacturer's advice on that, not going by that. But the, uh, when they uh, did do the final report on the on the state outbreak, it was um, their primary water system was contaminated with fecal matter. Um, when you go to their website, um, they did not allow you to bring water bottles. Um, it's up in the zip line. They've got people moving fast. They've got people hundreds of feet in the air. So they don't want anything falling out of your pocket. So they don't let you bring any water in the park whatsoever. No water bottles, no unsecured item, no dangling jewelry, um, uh, no loose-fitting clothes. Um, they want you to leave all your valuables at home. Things are falling out of the zip line. So really, that's it. They don't let you bring any water to the park. Um, so how do you get your, when you go to this park and you're up in these trees, how do you, how do you stay hydrated? Um, well, they have these igloo water bottles, and uh, y'all are kind of far away from this. You can't see it up close, but these igloo jugs are well-worn. And then when you look at the jug, you can, I've seen these on farms with farm workers, but uh, you have to put your hand right up to the spout and get your cup of water. It's a very hands-on process here, so if you, you know, if your sanitation process is low, um, that's going to easily get contaminated. 
And they had to refill these every every day. Um, so how were they refilled? Um, with the zip line, they hire a lot of college students. Um, that you know, it's temporary work. So a lot of the workers there are temporary. Um, and with their um, with the state health department report, they actually showed where the um, the break room was for these college students. So this this is pictures of their um, shelving. Um, it's a mess. And there's their lunch table. It's a mess too. I don't. It hadn't been cleaned in a week. So, you know, if they're this dirty with their own food, how dirty do you think they were with the water? Okay, this is the, the nuts and bolts, and it's hard for you to see from back there, but um, um, this is what epidemiologists love here. This is Christmas for epidemiologists here, but um, the exposures are in the blue box here, and they do all the exposures, that, and from the top is treetop zip lining, mountaintop zip lining, mountain biking, uh, if you drank a beverage while you're at the um, zip lining part, if you drank water from one of the water stations, uh, and this is part of epidemiology too, you get some people who just can't recall. So we've got a category for that. So here's the odds ratio. The, so the odds ratio is um, a one typically is there's no difference between, there's, um, but if you're less than one, it's kind of a protected value that um, you weren't exposed to whatever the people who were sick with. And if it's higher than one, then you did have some extra risk there. So the higher numbers are giving us the clue of where what was going on. So the treetop zip lining was actually 0.6%. Um, so the people who went up in the treetops, the zip line, um, actually, it, it, they didn't get as sick as the, um, the mountaintop people had a 50% a increase as far as chance of getting sick. Um, the people who went mount, mountain biking had a double, double the chance of getting sick. So, um, you know, what was it about the mountain biking that made it more hazardous? Um, I really think the mountain bikers probably went there day after day after day, and they spent more time at the park, um, where the zip liners are probably a, a one-time tourist, and they, they do it once, and they continue their vacation. Um, here's this four-fold increase here. The um, people who drank water from those igloo jugs had a four-fold increase in risk of being coming sick. Okay, my next story is um, we had this, this case was many years ago, um, but we had a three-year-old female come back. She had um, um, altered mental status, um, poor oral intake, very weak cry, um, the infant was healthy other than, uh, you know, these conditions that had just popped up. No f history of fever, hypothermia, ingestions, trauma, um, or exposures to anyone sick. Okay, we're talking about place today. The baby lives in New Jersey. Um, the baby had um, traveled with the mom and dad by car. They had left New Jersey. They had gone to Florida for the weekend, for a wet weekend wedding. And when they were coming back, um, this baby had gotten sick. Back, she's traveling back through North Carolina, going to New Jersey. So the baby becomes sick while they're in the car going back home. Um, so the baby um, started having symptoms. The symptoms were um, couldn't swallow well. You know, secretions just piling up um, and then progressive worsening. So we're here talking about laboratory results. As far as the um, the white count was a uh, 5.8. That's normal. Hemoglobin was 9.5, which is a little bit low, but it's fine. Electrolytes, the sodium, the potassium, they're fine. Um, the spinal fluid, they did do a spinal tap uh, on this child. Um, no white cells, meaning no meningitis. Uh, no red cells, uh, basically would be with the trauma. And the spinal fluid, protein, and glucose were normal. So basically a normal spinal tap. Uh, we're not thinking meningitis at all. Um, we do have this. This viral respiratory panel is something we've been doing for the last six years, and it's fantastic. You run one nasal swab, NP swab, and you get 14 different viruses with that one swab. It's a fantastic test. It's called Biofire. I love it. Um, this same, this Biofire, um, going back to the outbreak I was talking about with the water, they have one for stool testing. That's what they ran on that water test water system. But uh, this is the Biofire for... Um, respiratory viral pathogens, so it worked very well, but this kid tests positive for rhinovirus slash enterovirus. There's 
hundreds, this is the common cold here. So, you know, is this what this kid has? Is, is the rhinovirus? So the doctors have to add that to the mix. Um, the ketones were two plus, meaning the child wasn't eating well, probably vomiting. I mean, the imaging, the CT scan, and the MRI were normal. So what were the doctors thinking? The, the working differential, um, the doctors are saying, um, you know, maybe we've got an intracranial bleed here, something traumatic, or um, maybe we have an infection. Um, their workup also included, you know, is this septus, is it bacteremia? Did toxic ingestion, did the baby eat something that was bad or a, a metabolic symptom? Some babies are born and they, they live for about two or three months before they start developing systems with the, symptoms with these metabolic things. And then we had one doctor say, well, um, could this be baby bot? I, you know, I, I, didn't, I had never heard of baby bot. I didn't know what baby bot was. And I just thought it was some sort of cute baby robot at the time that uh, I didn't know what baby bot was. But the, um, the next day, this child has some sort of weird eye movement that's consistent with uh, botulism. Uh, a, we sent a stool sample to the CDC, and they had this rat bioassay, and it was positive. But the, the rat bioassay is they, um, you've got your um, victim, and you get a stool sample. And um, they, we send this, they only can do this rat assay at the CDC, but they uh, inject the uh, patient's stool into the rat. And if the rat goes into respiratory distress, that's a positive test for botulism. And then, you know, it might be due to other things as far as, you know, the rat just got congested with, injected with stool, so it could be several things. But then they do a confirmation test where they actually have a neutralizing antigen, antibody, that they um, mix with the uh, stool solution, and then they inject, the rat, they inject a new rat and see if that neutralization stops it. So if, it, if the neutralization for botulism works, then... It's a confirmatory test, and yes, you have a botulism test. This is part of some research that was done back in the 50s. It didn't get published till like 1979, but I, I love this research here that um, um, botulism comes from the soil. And we had this one researcher that he would take family vacations, and he would take soil samples on his vac family vacation. He would drive from the east end or the west to the east um, in the United States, and he'd click family must have hated him for stopping every 50 miles to uh, pick up soil samples. But you can see that the over on the right, there's a lot of um, uh, botulism A in the west and a lot of botulism B in the east. Um, but it's some fantastic research. And from that, uh, we discovered, you know, that we do have these different types of botulism. They're, they're in places. You know, certain places have them and certain places don't have this botulism. Um, so we got the map here from the CDC, and this is from 2014, the confirmed number of cases of infant botulism. So for the whole year, we only had 128 infant botulism cases. And then you can see clusters. You can see California with 50 cases. Well, there's a lot of people in California, but um, New Jersey has um, 10 cases. So New Jersey is a hot spot for botulism. Um, and then North Carolina, you can, North Carolina's a blank. Um, we don't have any baby botulism in North Carolina. We rarely see it, and we, we, we only see it in travelers. And that's when our, our pediatricians need to be aware that, you know, if they see a, a baby lacking tone that's had no problems at all, they might suspect uh, botulism. So um, epidemiologists do love Google Maps. Whenever I have something weird like, um, I want to look at somebody's house like they've got some sort of mosquito-borne disease. I'd like to see, you know, does the house have window screens in it? Does it have its own air conditioning? So often I go to Google Maps, and um, you can actually see the houses, but uh, I saw the Google car on um, at my office that I waved at, so this is actually me on Google Maps. <laughs> <clears throat> so we've got the sick baby. The baby lived in New Jersey. I really wanted to see where this baby lived at. What kind of dirt was this baby exposed to? And when I did Google the, the, um, the baby's apartment house, they lived across the street from this, um, this is not Highway 70, this is Highway 70 in New Jersey. They lived across from this flea market and had an unpaid parking lot, so it was just a dust bowl. Uh, so there had to be tons and tons of dirt, dust, coming off of this flea market with, um, you know, everybody was parking on it, so the amount of dust getting kicked up from that. And um, when you looked at it on Google Maps, there was a ton of construction going on they would just strip off the entire lot to where it was nothing but raw dirt, 
And that was also going on around this baby's apartment. Okay, I'm from Newburn, and this is the Cedar Grove Cemetery in Newburn. Um, the, um, we've got this limestone gate, and the, uh, the saying is that it, it leaks, it drips, that condensation on that, and uh, if it drips on you, you're going to be the next to die, is the rumor in Newburn. So uh, come to our Halloween um, tours, and you, they'll, we'll tour you through the uh, Cedar Grove Cemetery. But when you go into the Cedar Grove Cemetery, these are the first five gravestones you see. And when I walk in Cedar Grove Cemetery, <clears throat> it really hit me that there's something unusual about these five gravestones is that they are, when you look at everybody else, they don't really match. You know, even husbands and wives won't match that well. Um, but these match perfectly. And you can tell that they were pretty much all done at the same time. That there, there is a period of time, but you have to wonder, well, how can five gravestones match so perfectly? And the dates on these things are uh, the, um, sep the late 1700s and um, early 1800s. But um, what happened here was the first cemetery in Newburn was at the churchyard. And with the uh, yellow fever outbreak, the uh, church, got, church graveyard got so full that they dug up many of the graves. They, they, it had a mass grave that had so much die off from yellow fever uh, in the late 1700s. Uh, they had a mass grave at the time. And then when things settled down, they created a new cemetery. And a lot of people that were in that mass grave got dug up and relocated to the new cemetery, which is now my old cemetery at Cedar Grove. So this is the, at this time, it was the new cemetery that people got relocated to. So that's why these uh, tombstones match so well. Um, when you look at these tombstones, there are two children in it that... um died within um, six weeks weeks of each other. Um, um, then this leads me into the... Um, Newburn did have a yellow fever outbreak. Um, and yellow fever is a mosquito-borne illness. And your typical, your first symptoms are fatigue, uh, jaundice, you turn yellow, uh, and black vomit. Um, yellow fever is endemic in South America and Africa. So when you look at the chart where yellow fever actually has hit, um, Newburn is on this list three times. Uh, Philadelphia meets the same thing too. It's on the, the list three times. So uh, when you look at this list, um, you know, it was obvious to me that um, it's seaports, that, uh, you know, there's something going on with seaports. I've had other people say, well, you know, this is where there was just a lot of travel at, but, you know, there's a lot of travel in Atlanta. There was a lot of travel in Raleigh. There's a lot of travel in Chicago. But they've never had yellow fever outbreaks in those, those landlocked areas. So there's got to be something peculiar that connects yellow fever with seaports. So this is part of that mystery of yellow fever. Why, you know, why, were, why were seaports at such danger? And the mystery was, you know, they didn't really know anything about yellow fever at this time. And the question was, is it contagious person to person? And they would, um, they were, they were starting to think it was contagious person to person because they'd get these, uh, six sailors on the ship and they'd send them to see the ship's physician and the ship's doctor, the ship's physician was always the first one to get sick with yellow fever. That the, the physicians were very susceptible to yellow fever and they started thinking, well, maybe this is transmitted person to person. You know, there's no mosquito involved there that it's the person person transmission, but the, the doctors were really exposed to a lot of blood with these sailors. So it was, they were getting blood on them and they're cut. So that was the yellow fever there. But they began to think more and more about the yellow fever being uh, mosquito-borne. Um, they had these very savvy sea captains, and you had these boats leaving England, going to Africa, going to South America, and they had a lot of young sailors on there. And these young sailors would get very scared about um, going into yellow fever country. That, that you know, They're thinking that a lot of us are going get, get, to get sick. Some of us may possibly die. So um, it was the captains would put the young sailors at ease by um, getting vomit uh, and blood from the sailors that were sick with yellow fever, spreading it all over them, possibly even eating it. So, and these old sea captains knew that um, that you only got yellow fever once, that um, and they had had yellow fever before in the past. So uh, they were really putting the the crew at ease, but uh, really weren't alleviating their chance of yellow fever. They were still very much at risk of yellow fever, but uh, 
the captains had, had already had their yellow fever and they were immune to yellow fever. So, um, and then they had this thing where um, they had fleets of about 20 ships. And you'd only have like one or two ships that would get sick with yellow fever. So, you know, these 20 ships would go to Africa or these 20 ships would go to South America. Why would only one or two boats get sick with yellow fever? Um, so they're starting to learn more and more that, hey, it's the mosquitoes that these boats have some sort of bio system, some sort of life cycle, some th sort of ecosystem that allows these mosquitoes to breed on this boat. You know, all that water, all these new sailors, it really forms the perfect ecosystem, the perfect wave to create this wave of yellow fever. And then these yellow fever ships would come into uh, seaports in temperate, in, in temperate areas, such as um, Newburn. Philadelphia, and while the ships were parked there, um, those yellow fever mosquitoes would get released into the communities. Um, and this is Walter Reed. I've got a picture of him. Um, he's the um, army general, army doctor that uh, discovered yellow fever, discovered the connection between the uh, 80s Egypti was the cause. Um, Max Thaler developed a vaccine to it in 1937 and got the no Mobile Peace Prize, 1939. So um, we're talking about yellow fever, we're talking about the Zika mosquito, or, or we're talking about the 80s Egypti mosquito. Um, and then that leads into a couple of years ago, we had the, the Zika outbreak. So Zika is transmitted just like yellow fever is transmitted by the, the uh, yellow fever mosquito, the 80s Egypti. Um, a couple of years ago, there was this big debate whether we had 80s Egypti mosquitoes in North Carolina. And I, I was not in this room. I was talking to the health department, the old health department. And I said, well, I was trying to put everybody at ease. We don't have any 80s Egypti in North Carolina. And uh, I had the Marines stand up and say, oh, oh, oh Mr. Cleve, <laughs> we've got 80s Egypti in our containers. That um, The Marine, um, Marines have these huge boxes, huge containers that are full of water that... um that they bring back things. There are things, there are insects and certain things that, huge containers that are hard to disinfect. Um, have you started adding mosquito disinfectant to your containers or? No. Do you have 80s Egypti on the, on the base? Do you? Because you, do we have an entomologist here? I only got here a couple, uh, two months ago, so we haven't done any surveillance for you. Okay. I think more so albopictus, yeah. 80s albopictus. Yeah, that's kind of the weaker cut. That is known to transmit it too, but not, not as virulently as 80s Egypti. Most 80s Egypti around this region, even going farther down before, have been displaced by the uh in the last 10, 10 20 years or so. I, I, did, I did hear somebody say, the State Health Department said, yes, we did officially have 80s Egypti about 20 years ago, but we don't have it anymore. Okay, I'm from New Bern, and... Uh, 20 years ago, fisteria was a big deal in Newburn. So a show of hands, how many people even know what the word fisteria means? Hold up your hand if you know what fisteria is. Fisteria is this one cell dinoflagellate. It's kind of a relative to algae, but uh, it's in the water. And uh, there was this big debate we were having in Newburn and the Chesapeake Bay. We were having fish with huge sores on them, and they would die. So there's this question of what these, what's causing these sores. Um, and it was this huge debate between the, um, the players in this were the um, university research professors, um, the state public health department, um, and, and the, the environmental polluters. So there were a lot of environmental polluters 20 years ago than what they are now. But um, it was very easy to prove that our waters were polluted. Yes, the Neuse River is a very slow-moving river. And yes, that river was polluted. It gets very hot. And it's a big challenge on the fish as far as the oxygen gets depleted in that hot, slow-moving water. And we do have a lot of fish kills. Um, and there were these sores, but um, you know, there's also this question what public health wanted to prove was, was this detrimental to human health? So it was very difficult to prove that, but um, we're talking about 20 years, you know, our take-home messages are that, you know, this uncertain science really hurt the uh, local economy of Newburn. We had some crabbing industries in, in the Noose River and the, and that was completely obliterated. After this came out, there were no more crabbers in Newburn uh, at that time. Um, but then, um, you know, public health and academia 
need to work together. We need to meet each other before we have these sort of events. Um, and then, yes, pollution does have an impact on human health. So when the, when the state was looking at all this hysteria stuff, you know, they, they were really questioning, is there something with coastal water associated with microorganisms that could be impacting human health? And they did find, yes, there, there, is, some, there is an organism that we need to be careful with. Um, I'm calling this the creature from the Black Lagoon, but uh, this is Vibrio vulnificus. Um, and then the um, two pictures on the right are the infection. That's what, you get these huge blisters on your hand, like you get the crab bite and your hands will blow up and then it'll start progressing up your arm or you'll get a cut on your ankle. This picture here on the right is um, what the doctors do to save your life. They have to remove all that skin tissue, all that infective skin tissue, so they open you up and take all that fascia out. And that, that's after surgery, that's what it looks like. So it, it's bad either way. So my personal experience, I grew up in the laboratory, so I, you know, associated with this crab bite, you get this older fisherman and he'd rapidly get sick. He'd have a crab bite one day and his arm's about to fall off the next day with a fever, he's very delirious. Uh, it was rapid, it was fatal. Um, and then we had some strange growth requirements in the laboratory that we'd have it on our auger plates, our, and it would be growing very well on our auger plates, and then we'd put it into our test kits to identify or test kits to do susceptibility testing on it, and it wouldn't grow at all. You know, you've got this thing that's growing fantastic on the plate, and then you put it into another system and it won't grow at all. Well, what we discovered was um, this organism needed salt to grow, that we, if we added a drop of salt to every test well, it would grow fine, it would grow outrageously. You know? But it was very difficult to identify that um, people who were not on the coast, scientists weren't on the coast, um, really didn't know about Vibrio vulnificus, like it was something new for the state health department too in Raleigh that they, they, they didn't have any Vibrio vulnificus in Raleigh, but we did have it on the coast. But it was becoming more and more well better known, better known, and it was gram-negative rod. It's, it's a cousin to cholera, and cholera is a, a gram-negative bent rod. Um, the difference with cholera was that it's, um, it's more wound-based, like you step on an oyster, you step on a shell, you step on something in brackish water, um, but it's wound-based. Um, and it was far more, it was, it was older men with brackish water exposure that were getting sick. So, you know, why is it this older men thing? Well, they found that the, um, not only does the organism like salt, but it also needs iron to grow. And the older men, um, older men have more iron than anybody else in the population does. That um, Your liver starts to go and you, uh, you're storing up all this iron. So older men have more higher iron levels than anybody else in the population. So it's naturally occurring in um, estuary water. And it likes brackish water. Um, as far as the salinity, the warmer the water is, the better. Um, it is inhibited by ocean water. Um, it will not grow from ocean water as far as that salt is just way too high for it. It is seen in marine creatures such as crabs and oysters. Um, and this is some work that was done in Moorhead City. We've got a lot of marine researchers in Moorhead City. There's probably more marine research people in Moorhead City than there are health department people. So there's a lot of, Chapel Hill has a place there, Duke has a place there, State has a place there, so there's a ton of research people, but this work was done, and, and they're proving, you know, what zones, the red zones are where um, the salinity and the water temperature, the higher the temperature, and when it hits that, just that, just right salinity as far as not too fresh, not too ocean water, not too salty, that you get the red spots where the, uh, the organism's proliferating. Uh, North Carolina's fantastic as far as, this is a new thing, if you wanna know, like how many Legionella cases there are, how many tuberculosis cases there are. North Carolina Communicable Disease has a dashboard where they will actually say how much is here. On this bottom line here is how many cases going back to 2004 um, up to 2018. So in 2018, we had five cases of Vibrio vulnificus. Um, is that Onslow County lighting up? So Onslow County had um, two cases that year. So it's, it's not a lot. Um, I love looking at Florida. When you look at Florida, you see a, if you're worried about mosquito things, if you're worried about hot water things, if you're worried about sl go to Florida and look at what's going on there. But I've got the uh, the 
the, the places outlined where they've got the most vibria. So when you look at these like number one, number two, number three, number four, they're all associated with these little inlets of water. So when you look at North Carolina, this is the Pamlico and Albemarle Sound. They, uh, they really, when you um, look up the definition for lagoon, lagoon is a section of salty water separated from the ocean with a thin strip of land. So um, when you Google the Albemarle and the Pamlico Sound in North Carolina, it actually qualifies as a lagoon. So, um, but the prevention tip is um, if you're out fishing, cover any open wounds. Uh, if I'm telling people um, in your fishing box, make sure you've got the triple antibiotic ointment. If you get a cut, go ahead and put it on immediately. That's my talk. Any questions, suggestions, comments? Thank you very much.